Welcome to the Stoic Sound podcast, where we talk about life, love, work, play, the universe, and a bit of Stoicism. Today, I am going to be speaking to Duff Lambros, who has a number of projects, um, has worked in the film industry, is a film producer, has written books, has worked on MTV, has had an acting career, has worked in nursing homes, has worked as a hospice chaplain, does work as a hospice chaplain, and in 95, 95 was diagnosed with a disease that would give her chronic pain and it was a friend of hers who gifted her Marcus Aurelius's meditations that introduced her to the world and philosophy of the Stoics and that has been an ongoing theme in her life and it was really great chatting with her um, today. So I hope you enjoy this podcast, my conversation with Duff Lambros about Stoicism about creativity, about reading lots, about worshipping the most important organ in your body, your mind, about choice, about just having, just getting up and doing your job, just living your life. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Stoic Salon podcast. I'm really interested in the Stoic concept of flow being kind of just in accordance with nature and the concept of flourish, how we can use sort of Stoic principles to flourish in our lives. But I don't want these podcasts to be just about Stoicism, but I do want to be talking to lovely women like Karen Duff Lambros. Hey, Karen, do I call you Karen or Duff? I forgot to ask you. Duff, please. Duff. I'm talking to Duff today and just imagine that we've met in a cafe, two women catching up on life and the universe and how stoicism has and is playing a role in our lives. So Duff, welcome to the Stoic Salon podcast. I've got so much to talk to you about. <laughs> um, but first of all, I want to ask you, because the first time I've met you, Mm -hmm. um, albeit via Zoom. Of course, I know about you and I, I did listen to your talk at StoicCon last year. I was, I took my phone with me and I was taking my dog for a walk and I could hear you. I listened to you while I was just walking along the shore with Henry. So it was a really lovely way to get to know you mm -hmm. <laughs> while walking. So, um, Parapatu. Sorry? Well, uh, the Greeks call yeah, but, yeah. Like, philosophical walking in uh, Aristotle's school was called the, the peripatetic school. So we yeah. met in Parapatu. We certainly did. <laughs> it was the best way to meet, actually. Exactly. <laughs> actually, we should take our Zoom <laughs> with us now. Yes, yes. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, I was actually thinking because, um, as you know, because you'll be speaking at Stoke at the very first Stoke on X Women. This is a tangent. I'll get back to this later. But I was thinking, wouldn't it be lovely to have a kind of peripatetic event where all of us just grab our phones, log onto a call, and we just walk around wherever we are and just talk philosophy? It would be. <laughs> that is such a beautiful exercise. Imagine, yeah. you know, and. I mean, I would love to show you I am in the Berkshire Mountains of Connecticut, where we have about four feet of snow and just had an ice storm. And uh, just everything I see is coated with ice and glistening. And I just I would love to see what you see and invite you to see what I see. And that's yeah. the magic of being connected by Zoom is I, in the museum of memories I carry in my head, I can remember walking along the shore in Scotland. So I'm right there next to you. Oh, lovely. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about you. I'm kind of really interested in the before and after stoicism. I think we all have a story that has somehow brought us to 
the Stoic teachings or Donald Robertson for the most part. <laughs> I think that everyone's kind of gone through the Google a- algorithms to Donald and then modern Stoicism. All. We've all got a path. But I'm interested in you as the before Stoicism. And, um, yeah, tell me what life was like for you and then lead me to that pivotal point where you first kind of encountered the Stoics and, and then we'll go from there. So, well, thank you. Um, so uh, I grew up, um, my dad was a cop and grew up in, uh, my, in New York City, the West Village and in uh, New Jersey. And um, I grew up in a family where service was essential. You know, uh, my dad was always like, you know, service is the rent we pay to live on earth, to quote an American politician, Shirley Chisholm. Uh, And so all of us were expected to participate in some way that gave us meaning. Like my little sister raised uh, seeing eye puppies before they would get trained. And I really connected with working in a nursing home. Uh, So I have been working uh, and volunteering at a nursing home since I was 12. And that has never wavered. Um, and I really loved the sense of feeling that I was useful and I feel like we all have a choice to be useless or useful. And I figured, well, all right, I'll choose useful or at least try to, that's, um, you know, what I shoot for every day. And, uh, I went to college and got a degree, uh, in, um, a kind of special field called recreational therapy. And that is the idea that working with people who have disabilities, where you focus on ability, on what they can do. Mm. So for someone who say uh, paraplegic, you know, we could figure out a way to get you on skis or kayaking. So it was a lot of high risk recreation for um, people who have uh, physical disabilities. And as I did that, What's really interesting, Catherine, is that in America, almost all of the rehab hospitals are young men between the ages of about 18 and 38, which is when we are in our peak of health, but also uh, our cerebral cortex hasn't really fully developed and decision-making is pretty wobbly. And also nearly all of the injuries from skiing, diving, risk-taking are to impress women. So about 89% of the uh, hospitals were, were men. And, you know, they didn't want to hear from a young 22-year-old version of myself, like, let's get out there. They were like, I just want to know if I can have sex again. And I was like, you know, I'd be in a pool and all they, I'd be like trying to get them to swim and they'd be like, no, they want to, they want to talk about is the most primal urge. And I'm like, yeah. All right. So I, I moved back to working at a nursing home, um, where I worked at when I was 12, uh, and kind of left the population of, of in rehab hospitals into, uh, residential for, uh, people with dementia and, uh, Alzheimer's. And it was the greatest job of my life. I think when you love what you do, when you feel you are being of service, anything is possible. And I looked at the skill set of what I was good at. And I was impervious to shame because I would do anything to get a reaction out of one of my clients. So I would sing, I would have Frank Sinatra appreciation hour. I would do anything laugh at any corny joke, anything to, to kind of reach a person. So I realized, well, I have got that in my favor. And the fact that I was working with a population that had a two inch attention span, uh, it was at the same time I was living in New York city and MTV was available. And M- they said that MTV was reducing everyone's attention span. So I just made a videotape and sent it in. I had never been on camera before. I sent it in on a Friday and I had a screen test on Tuesday. And by Wednesday, I had like a very, I I had the prime time slot. And I think 
the challenges of, of knowing that I was a great recreational therapist, that I could really stick my neck out in a new direction because I, I had that confidence of knowing, well, if this doesn't work out, what's the worst they can do? They can fire me. So with that attitude, uh, it really worked out well. So I think I've always been very grateful and uh, I was drawn to the Stoics after reading Marcus Aurelius uh, um, meditations, kind of the gateway for many Stoics before Donald Robertson and Massimo and Sharon LaBelle's great books. Um, and I would say after reading meditations, um, I was, I really, I was drawn to meditations because kind of at the peak of my career where I kind of felt like I had, I was working at MTV. I had done a few movies. I was in Dumb and Dumber and a bunch of Woody Allen movies. Yeah. It felt like I had built a plane by hand and I was just ready to take it out. And then I wound up getting uh, diagnosed with a, uh, a degenerative nerve condition called sarcoidosis of the central nervous system. Was that in 1995? Yes. And so that really pumped the brakes on my uh, career in film and TV. So how long were you in your career at that point? I was five years mm. in, and I'd done a, uh, several movies. The interesting thing was Revlon had signed me up, which is a makeup company. Mm. And uh, it was like for a pretty long deal. And I was like, oh, should I? I've got to tell them. I mean, I, I'm not, I no longer look like the Gamine tomboy. I mean, I was bald and puffed up from all the steroids. My head was like the size of a pumpkin. So I was like, uh, listen, you should know. Like that ship has sailed. I will probably, and I, I, I'm not well and I don't look well. And they were like, don't worry about it. We focus on women's health and we'll keep you on. We hired you for your inner beauty anyway, which I thought was a kind wow. of amazing thing for a makeup company to say. Um, so what did you end up doing with Revlon what, during the time of your illness? Of the um, illness? They actually kept me on for f over 15 years and um, I still did commercials and what's amazing what you can do with lighting. Um, and uh, I did commercials up until about, probably for 10 years. And then uh, when another, like say if another actress was on set and she was having a hard time, they'd be like, do you mind just coming to set? And like, like, so I would, you know, I give them a pep talk and then they really kept me on for um, uh, going around the country speaking about uh, women's health and- wow. um, what was incredible was they had this great event and they've raised probably a hundred million dollars in uh, money. And rather than creating a bricks and mortar monument to themselves, they gave a hundred million dollars to research and came up with the first non-toxic um, treatment uh, um uh, called Herceptin and another uh, Tamoxifen. So they came up with really the two most, uh, in, in, like the, the best drugs for certain types of breast cancer. Um, so I was very happy to kind of be a part of that. Wow. Um, and, you know, I had a lot more time to read and I kind of always felt my goal is to try and read, you know, the, you know, when I was sick, I was like, well, I'm just going to make the most of it. Like when I was in the hospital, I was like, I'm just going to read a book a day. And reading meditations uh, was so enlightening. And then it brought me to Epictetus. And re reading. Do you remember who brought you, like, with, so Meditations was the first Stoic book that you read. Yes. How did that come into your hands? Did someone gift it to you? Did you find it somewhere? Did you? I mean, you didn't Google it. Obviously, that was 95, although the internet had just sort of started. Google yeah, wasn't out. Google wasn't around 95. <laughs> no, but Catherine, you saw how much trouble I had getting this Zoom call, so you know I wasn't Googling. No. Um, <laughs> you know what was amazing was uh, 
so, you know, I was riding the penthouse elevator to, you know, I, I was really on this Nantucket ride to success and I was having so much fun. So I rented this, this cool townhouse and I had all these extra rooms and a buddy of mine was in California who was a TV producer, I'm sorry, film producer. And I was, and he's like, ah, things aren't going so well. And I was like, well, you know, you can come into New York. You can have one room as an office, one as your bedroom. And, uh, you know, I said, just the number of chicks that you will meet just from, you know, of my friends, it's worth that to come. So uh, his name is David Heyman. And, um, and David, who is an incredible charismatic gentleman, uh, he bought me the entire set of uh, the Penguin Classics, the 50p when I was sick. And um, so he gave it to me. And the most beautiful thing is that David uh, Heyman, I, uh, I remember when, when he was moving back to London and I was eloping with my uh, husband, uh, David was in, moved back to London and I remember saying like, happy Christmas. And he said, oh, I've got some good news. And he'd only been there for about three weeks. And I was like, oh, what is it? And he goes, oh, I've just bought the rights for these Potter books. And I was like, fantastic. And I thought it was Beatrix Potter, but my my roommate bought the rights to all the Harry Potter books. So David Heyman is in the history of film, the most successful producer of all time. And it could not have happened to a better lad. And he was the man who gave me uh, meditations. Wow. <laughs> he gave me the, he gave me the uh, uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh -huh. I was in the hospital at the time and I just had last rites. And I was like, and I kind of loved that David was like, yeah, he's a, you know, I, like, I just loved his fearlessness. And I think that that has served him very well as a film producer. Um, and I believe, you know, he got a lot out of, uh, out of uh, reading meditations. Mm -hmm. And, but really it was uh, when I just cracked open uh, Epictetus, I mean, where, in the line where he says, um, you know, beautiful choices will make a beautiful life. It was like a, a firecracker went off in a symbol factory. Like everything in my head just went bingo. It hit the jackpot. My eyes were three cherries. I was like, this is what life is about. And, um, you know, I've had a devotion to reading, um, you know, the Stoics every day. It's amazing. They say that in New York City, you're never more than like three feet from a rat. And I will say in my life, I am never more than three feet from a stack of books. And I'm looking at my, I've got Epictetus, the art of living. And then I've got the, um, uh, the classics library. I mean, they're always just like right behind me because every time I sit down, I just, what I love, there is, I don't know. Have you ever heard of bibliomancy? Yeah. The divining. And uh, yeah. I love, I, I love it. So could you explain it maybe to your listeners who don't know what it is? Isn't it just the idea of connecting with the book and it being like magical in a way? A kind yes. Of so it's spiritual. Like directive, contemplative, mm -hmm. oh, maybe you should explain, you might explain yeah. it better than me. Yeah, you, you got it, it perfectly. Yeah. Yes, okay. You've got it. So it's, it's divine. Um, bibliomancy is an ancient form of divining where back, you know, in ancient times they would look in animal entrails and, you know, the stars to look for guidance. Um, but after um, Gutenberg created the printed press and books were more available, the idea of bibliomancy. So you'd ask the universe a question and then through a book of philosophy, you then open, blindly open it, close your eyes, open the page and then boom, pop your foot on it. And um, pop, pop your finger on a word and it will essentially guide you for the day. And 
And I love it because. What have you got? What have you got? So right now it said, but if our souls are so bound up with God and joined together with him, be the parts, the portion of his being. Uh, You have the power to think about divine dispensation to each and several things among the divine. So it always works. That's the great thing about bibliomancy is that, uh, you know, it's about interpretation and, you know, uh, how we perceive the world. And uh, it's just another way to connect. And I always have fun um, doing it. I was on the phone with my publisher the other day and we're trying to pick a new title for my book that's coming out in um, 2022. And I said, well, let me just try bibliomancy. Come on, let's just all try it. And maybe we could each pick a word. Um, Maybe we're onto something. But uh, I just find that uh, I'm a a grown-up Catholic. Today is Ash Wednesday. I am a practicing Catholic as and as much and as my backbone is Catholic, I would say my central nervous system, uh, my higher uh, parts of my brain are all connected to the Stoics. And what I love about Stoicism is that it uh, there's a, a solitary quality, but also when you meet somebody who mm. is also into stoicism like it's amazing the things that you learn it's fantastic yeah. it's, it's i was actually quite surprised how social stoic philosophy stoic practice is because i always i sort of i did philosophy sort of as an undergrad and, and some of my master's stuff and it was always kind of the theoretical version with the, the armchair kind of philosophy and when i first came across the modern stoicism and started reading the stoics kind of in my late like last few years um, I was quite interested and amazed by the expectation and invitation to being social, a social stoic, like getting into groups, meeting people at the stoa, you know, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So um, that is quite interesting. I want to ask you a question about, so when you first, because I have I think it was Bill Irvin and then I also spoke to someone else and then a friend of mine, I lead this group on Facebook called the Stoic Salon and um, we kind of, most of us are kind of writers and we write and read with the Stoics. So I do a whole lot of journaling challenges, that sort of thing. And one member is a physician in um, New Hampshire and she, She considers herself, I think she calls it an intuitive stoic, but she feels that stoicism was always like just a real natural part of her disposition, even as a child. And I think Bill Irvin called it congenital stoicism or something Mm -hmm. like that, like just that he's like a natural stoic. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, did you feel that when you first encountered the stoics back in 95? Was it a struggle? Was it just, oh yeah, these are my people? What, what? sort of experience i remember um i would you know it's funny um you know in people think of intuitive stoicism or congenital um i'm like an extroverted stoic um and those are not in conflict with each other i think i find stoic philosophy philosophy to be exploding with happiness and uh with adventure and it's like cracking open uh you know bill irving's book or massimo pugliacci's book it's just like to me it's it's like an adrenaline rush it's like a blow to the head and uh i i love that um there is a connection i think that you know i've um uh i have you know a spiritual practice but you know have a philosophical practice and um i became a hospice chaplain um uh, about 10 years ago um i just felt very like when i speak to you i'm 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 so happy to see you and i'm happy to talk to you so i'm 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 at a high energy but when i walk into a hospice or the hospital, like I am, I, I bring it way down. And, um, 
I feel that Stoic connects to the part of me that, you know, is the good time Charlie and is the more uh, s solemn uh, and uh, more contemplative. And um, that's what I think the great appeal of these ancient uh, writers um, and thinkers is um, that, you know, they were hanging out with their friends, you know, chatting and, uh, and I love the sense of the forgi of forgiveness that I love how Marcus Aurelius, you know, like, I don't know, when you've got a big head of steam built about some crazy injustice and Marcus Aurelius said, well, you know, the best way to deal with an adversary is to not be like them. And, uh, uh, I made a promise that every time a certain politician made me insane, I was just going to make a donation to the food bank. So then I'd feel better. Mm. And it, and it worked. And I felt like, well, maybe, you know, that's not exactly what, you know, Marcus Aurelius meant when he was journaling to himself on a battlefield, but um, it worked. Like it, it diverted my anger and I took an action that made things help somebody eat made me feel like I wasn't just a jackass. So that is so that's such a good strategy because I think that we often get really and and legitimately angry at things or people in power and get so angry that then that paralyzes from us from doing anything because we feel we can't do anything about that thing. Mm -hmm. And so we don't do anything. But your strategy of then actually, you know, thinking well what can I do I can actually I can actually donate to a cause mm -hmm. you know which might not solve the other problem directly but um, it definitely gives you the choice to act and to actually do some good beyond yourself so that's really interesting because I felt a lot of people get really paralyzed and end up not acting or procrastinating or putting things off and not doing anything because they're so angry at this thing that they can't control. So I feel that's like reading the Stoics is like getting a kick in my <laughs> pants. Like every day it's like, get up and live. And, um, yeah. uh, and yeah. so, yeah, I, I don't find it to be like a turtleneck wearing cafe, like, <laughs> like taking myself so seriously. Um, because uh, there's so much happiness bound on those hard covers that, uh, and so much inspiration. Mm -hmm. And I was at the uh, Aspen Ideas Institute a couple years ago, and the theme was ideas don't count without action. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, like, that's so stoic. Like, like when you have. I think the lens of stoicism, you're able to see it more in, you know, our constitution, in, in other great philosophers. Um, and I just believe it's Epictetus to be the wittiest and wisest uh, to have ever drawn a breath. Do you have a favorite? Look, um, that's a hard question, obviously. <laughs> um I think my favourite, I think I'm like secretly in love with Marcus Aurelius, mm -hmm. right? I just think I spent like a whole lot of time every morning just sitting with my morning beverage and just reading him and then copying out his, like literally just copying word for mm -hmm. word and then sort of doing a bit of paraphrasing and stuff like that. And his voice is so gentle, right? Just mm -hmm. that gentle nudge. Like I remember I had to, I used to have to go to ballet, like it was three and a half. I never wanted to go ballet. And my mum's like, I remember my mum's gentle hands just at the <laughs> base of my back, just gently pushing me into the ballet class. <laughs> and Marcus Aurelius is like that. It's just that gentle push into life, into like just focus. Um, so I do like him. Um, recently I started reading more Seneca. I hadn't really read mm -hmm. Seneca and I think it's an absolute laugh of a minute. I was reading the Lucilius letters mm -hmm. and That's years ago enough. kind of read um, Epictetus. I was actually living in Greece in Breveza, which is where the ancient city of Nicopolis is, which is where Epictetus um, set up his 
school. So I lived there for about five years. So got to kind of read Epictetus like on the grounds where he was like teaching. But I, at the, then that was like around 2000 and around 2000, I was, I just thought Epictetus was really boring because I was like, in my high Greek drama phase back mm-hmm. then, you know, my high tragedy. Yes. Um, so, but I, I really appreciate Epictetus now. But at the moment, I think it's Marcus Aurelius. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the great uh, gift that we have is that there are there's such a breadth of um, minds to read. And I think the, the beauty is reading is essentially a dialogue. So mm-hmm. while we're silent, you know, they, their words become alive in our head and then rooted in our hearts. And then uh, I believe that, you know, we become what we think about the most. And mm. uh, so I always try to inspire that to my kid. It's just like, you know, just like, like look at your vessel as this empty pinata and I want to fill it with as much good and then when the world takes a whack at you, good things will come out. It's been, it's been amazing. My son is in boarding school and um, uh, he's been with me. He's, you know, we had a no technology at the table rule, except for philosophy books at breakfast. And it's just been such a gift, you know, uh, when we're together and we'll be, you know, at dinner and he'll just say, well, mom, you remember, as Aristotle said, worry is misuse of the imagination. And uh, how old is he now? Uh, he's 17. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's great. Like, I, I don't worry. I'm like, like, and like whenever there's a, my son is having a problem, I'm like, OK, on a scale to like me, which is a zero. And your dad, which is a 10, where are you on the worry scale? And he'd say, I'd say I'm about a two, maybe, you know, and it's just, it's funny just to um, understand that like right now, you know, with being locked up and with our pandemic and with so many of our people in our country dying and the fact that, uh, you know, I've had, you know, a lot of years. And so this is kind of a blip, but when you're a teenager, you've only had, you know, 17 winters. And this is his second winter of now he's a hockey player of being um, kind of held back. And I see his acceptance and like, there's no anger. He's just like, I remember him just, just last night. He's like, mom, there's always hope. And I think, wow. I think. Do you think that's his generation or do you think, because I'm really curious about the age at which Stoicism becomes like not an easy philosophy or a way of life, but a more kind of natural way of life. I wonder whether it's easier for a person to become and to accept kind of the Stoic teachings and practice when they're older, maybe less easy when they're younger. Do you have a comment on that based on it's been your son and his? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, my son is a varsity school goalie, ice hockey goalie in uh, New England at one of like the world's greatest hockey programs. And he fell in love with hockey when he was about three skating and then he about six, he said, I want to be a goalie and being a goalie is, you know, he's a little kid, you know, he will, you know, get slap shots at a hundred miles an hour at his face. And I realized that if I worried about him, I would siphon all the joy that he gets out of this game and uh seeing him as a goalie and if he lets a goal in he just said mom i have to turn the page like i can't go back in time and fix it i have to accept what happened and then i have like less than a second before another goal is trying to rattle me and so i think that 
when I've been trying to explain Stoic philosophy in sports terms, which is an overused metaphor, mm. but um, it seems to really work. And I think he, like, I have seen him, like, see how much love I get out of it, how I, like, I am radiating with optimism and I, I can't wait for a new day. And uh, I am working on this new book about um, Stoic philosophy, which is Letters to My Son. And the minute I wake up, I just think, today's another day I get to work on this and oh, there's yeah. so much joy in it. And I think that when my son who's been adjacent to this uh, has been really able to pick it up, but he also has that skill set of playing a very violent game uh, and being the, the net minder, the tender of the goal. So, uh, so I think they're simpatico. Yeah, and I'm wondering whether um, a child who is naturally inclined to be an athlete and a really, you know, good athlete, I wonder if also that mindset is more naturally attuned to Stoic mindset, a Stoic mindset. I don't know. The discipline. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The mm. practice. I mean, the, the idea is um, overcoming obstacles, which mm. is. I think a huge, huge part of, uh, I just, um, and living like in the present moment and, and accepting what you can control and what you can't, you can't always control the outcome of a, a game. Exactly. What, a effort, match. what do you call uh, the hockey? Yeah, <laughs> hockey okay. game? Yes. Uh, <laughs> one of the, um, one of the things that I love to do is I love to do needlepoint and, yeah. So I live in chronic pain. So I'm hopped up on goofballs all the time. And uh, I, I, the, the two things that I really love to do is I love to walk. And as we were talking about, like the idea of, you know, I think best on my legs. Um, but there are days when I really just can't go outside because I can't tolerate air on my neck because of my uh nerve disorder. So I sit quietly and I do my needlepoint. And I was speaking to my neurologist about it. And uh, cause I was like going crazy. I was just nonstop. And uh, I, um, my neurologist said like, when you engage in repetition, it soothes the amygdala, the part of the almond shaped part of your brain that controls uh, you know, your sense of well-being mm. and that when you do uh, activities that are repetitious, you are essentially soothing your, uh, your central nervous system. And so I've been working on um, the guy from the modern Stoics. I had a technical difficulty. So I'm making a needlepoint whoopee cushion uh, that has the di I'm in needlepoint in the dichotomy of control onto a cushion and then to give to our friends from modern Stoics. I make, I'm making three of them. And, uh, but I feel them <laughs> with whoopee cushion. So it just looks like, oh, look at this nice granny looking cushion. But then when you sit on it, it emits a tugboat fart. So <laughs> that, that's been, uh, <laughs> he's a dichotomy of control. I've been working on that. I have them all over the house. That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, I made one of the Pope because I just thought it'd be like, I found a needle point of the Pope and it's this giant Pope. And so I was giving it to a friend and I brought it to the upholsterer and I said, okay, you know, just fill it with the, the technology of whoopee cushions has now uh, reached peak whoopee cushion where you don't have to blow it up anymore. It just self inflates. And he was like, Miss Duff, I am not making a, no one can sit on the Pope's head. And make a poopy sound. I was like, no, 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 it's a prayer cushion. It's a masterpiece. I don't know, Catherine. Where does that, where does that cushion exist? Way. It may take a year, but <laughs> there may be classic. one headed your way for your office. Please, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my it. God, I love that idea. Oh my God, that's classic. That is too funny. <laughs> um, 
You've mentioned uh, you've mentioned the book that you're writing, which is letters to your son. Do you have? Can you share any other secret details with us? Or um... no, it is um, uh, my my mission was uh, because I I, uh, I have this rare illness, and it was very rare uh, that I got a chance to be a mother and. Um, my son doesn't have any siblings. And uh, so I wrote to him as an infant and I thought these will be a great idea. Like when I am no longer around to parent, but they're not solemn. They're, you know, they're cheeky. And then uh, I shared them with my agent and uh, it is, you know, essentially a love letter to life and how, lucky we are we are like we each of us has this unrepeatable brilliance within us and we are 40 trillion cells just humming with life force and every day like we have a choice like i live in chronic pain every day but i just do my best um you know, take my medicine. And then I'm really not that bothered about it. I mean, uh, I just keep myself, I think I, I have such a strong focus on what I want to do that I don't have a lot of time to think about, oh, I don't feel well. Because nobody really does at my age, you know, we all have our ups and downs. Um, but the, uh, you know, you, you mentioned your dog, Henrietta. And, you know, when you need to give Henrietta, you know, a pill, you probably wrap it in some bologna or liverwurst and then, then she'll eat it. Well, I think with these letters to my son, I have wrapped, like, there are strong, incorruptible, stoic values, but then I've wrapped it in a lot of <laughs> liverwurst and bologna to make <laughs> it go down easier. Uh, so I've just filled it with like, you know, insane bits of uh of of information uh that i think will appeal to uh to everyone i mean who doesn't want to know that the average person you know laughs 15 times a day and farts 14 times a day so like every page <laughs> i wanted there to be a laugh and some there's many different types of left. There's like, Oh, I understand. And they're like, Oh, I didn't know that. So I've really tried to hit all the high notes and um, I've been working on it for a few years and it is such a joy. Um, and uh, it, it's like when you have a project and the great thing is, is that it's within all of us, you know, like you just, if you, if you find what you love and even if it isn't, your absolute career um find something that you know gives you a a sense of this is why i'm here mm -hmm. this is why uh and uh and that's been been so great and i feel like i've kind of always always kind of known like even before i knew what i was meant for i was just pretty grateful to just be here and that to me is very simpatico with all of the stoic teachings, mm. the gratitude. You know. It's kind of interesting because you're talking about um, obviously being a very creative person. Uh, I mean, uh, your career um, and also now your writing. And I always thought the stoics weren't ever going to be an option for creative people, like, to offer any air to be relevant in any way whatsoever and it was only recently when I really paid attention to Marcus Aurelius where I saw the absolute literary beauty of his work um even even though the meditations don't really do much new philosophy so he's not actually you know doing anything you know he's not groundbreaking um but his the way he writes is so unique and so so stunning that really drew my attention and it seemed to me that he was producing a remarkable creative work despite the fact that there's no kind of you know original philosophy in it because mm -hmm. he's just he's just rehashing the, the stoic teachings so I was thinking a lot about 
originality and creativity and, you know, writing. Because I think the classic romantic image of the writer is, or the creative is this, you know, tragic hero who has to find something totally new and unique to do otherwise. What's the point? And I've learned a lot through Marcus Aurelius and also Arian, you know, Epictetus's student, the guy who kind of wrote down Epictetus's stuff. He kind of, do you remember like in the introduction, is it in the discourses or the handbook? I can't remember, but Arian actually writes a little prologue and he says, all right, I'm not actually right. I'm not the author of this stuff. Mm-hmm. It's actually Epictetus. And I don't care if people say that I'm not a unique author. I just want to write down what Epictetus said as honestly and authentically because maybe it'll help someone. And that was like, oh, my God, this guy doesn't care if he's, like, going to be original. He's just doing his job. And this was 20 centuries ago. This is remarkable. Yeah. So do you have any comments to say? I know we'll be talking about creativity at Stoke on X Women, which I'm really excited about on the, the creativity panel. But, yeah, tell me, what do you think about originality and creativity and what do the Stoics, what can they offer to the creative today? Because, of course, you know, the other thing, um, have you read Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic? Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of brings back that ancient idea of um, of creativity that, you know, you're not a genius, but you have genius comes to visit, you know. Mm-hmm. The it's, Aryan was not like this. Yeah, go ahead. It's not like, like, like it's almost like divining. Like when you were talking about yeah. um, your Facebook group with your journaling and how, you know, meditations was – called for himself. I mean, it was his journal. Um, I, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, which we're now in uh, 11 months in the US, uh, I sent The Artist's Way, that book, to, like, I just said, you know what? I'm going to send out 20 copies of this book to people. Oh, angel. With, <laughs> and, um, and the idea of just, we are capable of everything. And so if you like, so I've got a girlfriend who's a writer and she hasn't written in 15 years. Um, and, uh, and I'm always like, you know, come on, like you're so amazing. It just, just do it. And she's, and, and, I, I don't believe in writer's block. I believe that we hold ourselves back. And that what I believe that the Stoics have taught me is I have the key to my own cage, that I can unlock my cage and I can come ferociously bounding out um, every day. And every day I have a habit and uh, uh, it takes a couple hours when I get up for the medicine to work. So that's kind of my quiet time, my reading time. I take courses online. And then right about now, I'm able to hold a pencil at this point. And, uh, and I spend, a f- you know, the next few hours, like, like cracking myself up with, uh, you know, what I'm writing, what I'm thinking about. And I feel that like, I have to go so far and, you know, uh, and, you know, and then I'll bring myself back to where it's possible. And I feel like, um, like to be, everybody is creative and people always think, oh, you know, I'm not creative. And I just think like, that is, that is the meanest thing you could say. Like that mm. to me is like a, a form of, of self-hatred. Um, of abuse because we are all part of our creation and you can be creative. You know, I always just inspire people just to get out and walk and, you know, keep a reporter's notebook. And I don't, I write longhand. I love, I, I, I'm, I, I love light writing longhand. I have to use these special left-handed pens and, and I order, I just, I just love my little routine and, uh, I, uh, you know, and, and, and by the end of the day there, I just ball the papers up and my husband who is like, my husband's very much like Felix Unger is very meticulous and very neat. And he'll walk in to the dining room and I've got about 
200 balls up piece of paper and I love it. And he's like, are you going to pick this up? And it's like, that's the fun part at the end of the day. It's like I get a room and I just like, throw it in the fireplace. Um, and uh, So I just feel like, like people think that, you know, my girlfriend, she was like, oh, I want to start meditating and doing yoga. And I was like, great, you know, let's start. She goes, oh, no, no, I've got to first, I've got to build a yoga room. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Charles Bukowski, one of my favorite poets, he said, like, any writer, like, worth a damn can write anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that is true. You don't need an office. You don't need a quiet place. Uh, you know, use what you have. Like, I think my skills you know, as working as an actor, um, where I had to use that self-doubt, uh, oh, gosh, like you know, um, having to do this scene, I've got to memorize 10 pages of dialogue, like those jitters I would use to fuel that, oh, I'm going to make this fun. And um, I feel like all skills we have are transferable. What mm -hmm. I learned in a nursing home, you know, what I learned in college, uh, what I've learned living with a chronic illness that, uh, I love this idea of demonstratives was the, I may be bastardizing the pronunciation of his name, but he was an orator in ancient Greece and he, he was orphaned and his guardians stole his inheritance and Demosthenes had a horrible stammer. And so he was like, I've got to get my, my inheritance back. So he went into a cave and he shaved half of his head and he brought in enough food and then he would fill his mouth with yeah. small pebbles and practice his oration. And by the time he spat out the last uh, stone, he could speak and it became one of the most lauded uh, um, uh, orators and um, advocates of ancient Greece. Yeah. So I think that like we don't let our obstacles hold us down, figure out mm. a way. Like I'm really good friends yeah. with George Clooney. And so when George was in high school, he had Bell's palsy, which is where your face muscles go screwy. So, so for all of George's high school, his face was locked in this grimace. And he said one morning he woke up and he was drinking a glass of milk and it just went right down the front of his face. He couldn't feel his face. And his face was all um, held in this rictus. And then one day, you know, it, it spontaneously healed. And he looked in the mirror and he was George Clooney. <laughs> like he'd been so... And I think that's what makes him such a brilliant actor and humanitarian is because uh, he had an obstacle. And funny enough, the thing that he is most well known for is his beautiful face. Yeah. You know, it was all like screwed up for four years of mm -hmm. his biggest, you know, the part of your development where, you know, he was being rejected. And then his face turned out and all of a sudden he's the sexiest man in the world. <laughs> he will gladly <laughs> tell you. <laughs> does he correct you? Does he? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you've brought up so much stuff, everything from the artist's way, because I've just gone through like two rounds of it in the last couple of years. Um, and what else? The obstacle your friend to is saying, I need to build a yoga room before I do yoga. Or um, I was thinking that uh, because I actually came to the Stoics again because I thought I had writer's block, right? Mm -hmm. I was calling it writer's block, but I think it was, I don't know, maybe generalized anxiety plus depression or something like that. Because I, I agree with you. Writers, we don't, we're not short of ideas, right? There's some blockage, something that's going on. And I was thinking the Stoics probably have a bit to say to artists who are, who sort of say that, oh, I need this room, I need a room, I need a space, I need a desk, mm -hmm. I need a this, can't do it because I don't have that. And you know how the Stoics kind of um, suggest that you do um, put yourself through physical discomfort in order to prepare for, you know, adversity or loss or whatever. Um, 
I think a writer, you know, obviously set up your space, have your little sacred space, et cetera, but also be prepared to write without that space. Mm-hmm. And there you go. There could be a good little stoic exercise like every, I don't know, third day, twice a week, just write somewhere really uncomfortable and get used to doing it without your your stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like because, you know, as uh, Ryan Holiday aptly named it, so the obstacle is the way. The way. And um, uh, I remember I was going for a walk with my husband and we were talking and I was like, oh, yeah, I had this boyfriend when I was in college. And, you know, I was like this scrappy girl putting myself to school, working three jobs. And he had just got his trust fund inheritance and he was staggeringly wealthy and it drove me crazy because he could never make an, a decision he's like should i climb mount kenya or mount kenya? and i'm like you know what like you're the most boring person whatever's happened to you has turned you into the most boring person and forget about it oh my god um, and i think that um you know i was i was researching the reasons why people like won't write or won't attempt something. Mm. And what I recall is it's all been done before. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I, it won't be as good as I imagine. Yeah. Uh, people will laugh and say, why, why are you doing this? And I just think like, again, you know, give yourself the gift of the, of the Stoics. They are like a locksmith who will jimmy open you know that they know the combination to like let out your spirit because it is mirrored in these words and to me it's the greatest inspiration and again the greatest kick in the pants i don't find it to be this like oh i've got to go you know slog through it it's just like i'm like on my feet yeah like pumping my fist because it really just rattles my cage Mm. and um, I think that we, we hold ourselves back and, uh, uh, I believe, uh, I forget the, the quote was like, it's not that we are, are not as great as we will be. We are actually more powerful than we've ever imagined. And I think that that is a way to rejigger your thinking. Yeah. Uh, you never know. I mean, until you try, until you give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. I feel that you've kind of just like brought us to the end of this conversation, but I feel like I don't, I could talk to you for like hours. Like I just want to linger now. (laughs) And I'll come join your Facebook. I'm not really a Facebook person, but I, oh. I'm trying to move it off Facebook actually, but Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'll um, invite you to one of, I do these little like challenges where, for example, I'll send an email with an excerpt from Marcus Aurelius, for example, and then we do a bit of copy work. I literally just copy it out word for word and then maybe do a bit of word play, like just look at some words and change them because um, I think Marcus Aurelius actually, and I read it, I think, in a Donald Robertson article that Fronto, his tutor, had actually taught him to look at um, paraphrasing the teachings so that he could create texts that were memorable. Mm-hmm. I think Pierre Hadot talks about this, that the act of memorizing and, and sort of learning things by writing them in a way that really strikes your psyche so that you can remember them, so they can appeal and strike you loud and clear. I think Hadot, Pierre Hadot calls it rhetorical amplification. Is that amazing? Mm-hmm. Um, so they can speak loud and clear for you. So we do that sort of stuff. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I love the goddess, um, mono- the goddess of monomics. Monom- yeah. And, no, uh, I'm not going to be able to. Yeah, mnemon- so you- <laughs> mnemonics. <laughs> um, you know, I was in chatting with my son. I was like, you know, school is memorization, yeah. but like your education is what you'll get as a polymath. And uh, I think what you're talking about in, in memorizing, um, I think we all underestimate our uh, powers of memory. 
and mm -hmm. that uh, I try and memorize a quote a day. And I wanted to ask you that. Do you? Yes. And, you know, well, well, because it just, I like to entertain my family when we're at dinner. So, <laughs> you know, I'll memorize. It, it would, you know, it used to be just facts. Like I would just get like, you know, random facts. Like no one knows why we have an appendix. Like the, the, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a vestige of evolution. And our body is riddled with all these vestiges leftovers. So we've counted up five. So like, uh, I'll go on like a little like journey. Like today I'm going to learn about like why we have a tailbone, why we have like, and again, this, it's just, it's just to me, it's, it's amusing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I got into just memorizing, you know, quotes every day and not specifically from, uh, philosophy, and I just find that, you know, uh, it's a challenge. And if you're not challenged, you don't know what you're capable of. Mm. And mm. so uh, I look forward to, I'd love to be a part of your challenges. That would bring me such happiness. That would be fab. It'd be mm -hmm. great. And I'm so looking forward to uh, being together again. And June will be here before we know it. Hopefully you'll June get June the 5th. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Hopefully you'll get the jab. You'll get, you'll be inoculated. Oh, who knows? Is it going to be, is it going to be life after? Yes. Okay. We can only be hopeful. We can only live in the present moment and then yes. hope for the best. Exactly. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you before I let you go, <laughs> um, what sort of one, because I'm really interested in like practical stoicism. Mm -hmm. Like what's a kind of one practical thing that you would tell someone to do like on a daily basis? Hmm. Um, and it could be related to the pain management um, stuff, mindset or pandemic. No, forget the pandemic. Well, I but, think that um, uh, you know, so I, every day I deal in the morning, this is my time that I usually check in with people who are dealing with chronic pain or chronic illness or end of life. And, um, mm. and, you know, I think a, the big moment is like, you know, take, you know, we're the architect of our lives. And I think, you know, we become what we think about the most. Mm. And I think that is so clear. And that if you think, Oh, I got to, big ass. Oh, I can't do yoga until I have a room. Uh, I'm never going to make uh, this team. I'm never going to get a date. Well, you're not going to get it with that attitude. And that um, mm -hmm. what we think about, we have control over. Mm -hmm. And again, if you can take this beautiful bucket, I mean, the most amazing thing in the universe is on top of your shoulders. There is nothing in the universe like it. And you're, you've got complete control of it. And um, so, so use it, like burn it up, read as much as you can be, be as generous. Whenever there is an impulse to be generous, it would be a sin to not take that. Like just because you never know a, a generous action is generous to you. It's generous to the other person. And uh, I think we've seen what happens when you, when, when you don't act with generosity. So I think that mm -hmm. the most important message right now where we are is we become what we think about the most. Yeah. I love that. Mm, thank you. And Daph, tell me, what do you want us to know about you right now? So what do you want us to look up, read? Because um, um, I know you've got back, Backbones, the most recent book, which you talked about at yeah. StoCon last year. Um, What's the most important thing right now for us to know about you? Uh, well, I've got... Um, I'm a producer of an amazing film uh, about... It's, it's funny. So I, I'm a film producer as well um, because I, it's interesting. I, when I got sick, I could no longer be insured as an actor. Um, so I'd always been writing. Uh, and uh, so I've got two 
really spectacular movies. Uh, one is a documentary um, about Bill Murray and his uh, classical quartet. Uh, it's a documentary called New Worlds, Bill Murray at the Cradle of Civilization. Um, that oh, will be coming out. It's actually, it's a, it'll be at Khan and it'll be coming out this summer. Um, wow. And I wow. associate producer of that. And Congratulations. Then, that sounds very amazing. It's amazing. And Bill is, uh, Bill studied philosophy at the Sorbonne and um, uh, he's the most lovely man in the whole world. I'm actually at our farm in Connecticut and a couple of, probably about 10 years ago, uh, our friend Wes Anderson, I don't, did you ever hear of that? He did the fantastic Mr. Fox. So he recorded it here. So I'm in the room uh, where Mrs. or Mrs. Fox's, they had their bed. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, it's fun working on that. And I've got another uh, big film um, that I made a short documentary uh, that I associate pro produced. It's called uh, The World's Greatest Beer Run. It's on YouTube right now, but um, okay. Peter Fairley, uh, it's funny, we made this, my son's, uh, my son's girlfriend, uh, my son, I'm sorry, my son's babysitters uh, had a boyfriend and he was at film school. And I was like, why don't we just try and make a few things? I mean, you're like, he's in, he's in film school. So we made a documentary uh, about this amazing story of valor and how far you'd go for a friend. And it's about this guy, Chicky Donahue, who in 1968, four of his friends were drafted into the Vietnam War. And he was at a bar and he said, you know, when I was in the service, all I wanted was a nice cold beer. You know what? I'm going to go over and bring our boys a beer. So he got on a munitions ship and did shifts around the clock so he could get off the boat had a one shirt, one pair of pants, a duffel bag full of Pap's Blue Ribbon, got to Saigon and found his four friends, gave them all beer, all different, all over the country of, of Vietnam. And that his ship left and he got stuck during the Tet Offensive. And uh, it will be filmed in Australia with Russell Crowe. And, Killing me. Yeah. And... Uh, a few other great friends. So that's happening like in the next two months. So that will be out probably by the time Modern Stoics uh, comes out. So that'll be fun. So it's wow. nice, to have, you know, to be, it just takes years to work on a production um, as it does. It takes years to write a book and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess we're in it for the long game and enjoy the ride. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's interesting that, it, it, you know, if you don't focus on the product, you can really f enjoy just doing the best work every day. And I think, again, that's that kind of takes us back to this whole stoic mindset that it's not about what what's coming at the end of it. It's like enjoying every day that you work mm -hmm. on these projects. You know, Catherine, I think you'd really love um, uh, Twyla Tharp, the choreographer. Mm -hmm. She has written two books on creativity and the process. Um, <laughs> and uh, I didn't know she wrote books. She is okay. They are masterpieces, and um, and what she says is very similar to what you say. And I think you know she just so she is probably an octogenarian by now. Mm. And she said, like, every morning, like, she knows that when she puts on, like, her workout socks, she knows she's going to get in the cab and get to the gym and, and work no matter what. And that is, you know, the power of having good habits. And, mm. you know, she has been one of the most successful um, choreographers. But uh, her, mm. her two books are masterpieces. I highly recommend them. Well, thank you. I'm going to look them up. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, I look forward to um, getting ah. your email. And thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure to see your gorgeous face. You are you incandescent too. and you are giving so much to the world. So thank you very much for, for what you're doing with the Stoics, uh, the Salon, and for inspiring all of us. You know, every time we have an opportunity to be less stupid, I'm going to take it. So uh, I can't wait to get your emails and start practicing. 
Oh, Duff, thank you. I've so enjoyed chatting with you. I knew I would, and I can't wait to talk to you again. Oh, I get to talk to you again in June. So I won't say goodbye. I'll, I'll say until I well, fate permitting, you have to say, being a stoic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I look fate forward to chatting maybe, again. Maybe we'll meet in Greece. Oh, my God, can you imagine? At have- Costa Navarino. All right, it's a date. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Catherine. Take care, See man. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you Bye. Much.